I first want again to express my appreciation uh, to Jay and Shira Rutterman, Todd Rutterman, Sharon Shapiro, and all their colleagues at the Rutterman Family Foundation for all the work that you do to promote the inclusion of children and adults with disabilities as a social justice imperative. I thank you for that. I want to recognize also your wonderful mother, Marcia, who I met when I was here to receive the Morton E. Ruderman Award. And uh, I guess I would just say this. Thank you, Marcia, for raising children with the values that they have. Thank you for that. And Cindy Kaplan and uh, Mira. Mira left, huh? Yeah. Smart, she left before the politician speaks. <laughs> she got her priorities right. <laughs> that was a wonderful story about her, uh, her bat mitzvah. That was just very, very touching. And uh, uh, again, it just, it just shows that, that people can reach out and touch you in so many different ways and inspire you in so many different ways. So I thank you for that. When I was, uh, uh, and also I want to say Rabbi Wes Garden Schwartz, who was sitting someplace over here. Did he leave before the Polish? <laughs> anyway, when he was talking about healing the world, I asked Mark, I said, I remember a Hebrew phrase, tikkun olam, healing the world, right? So that's kind of what the Ruderman family and all of you are about, tikkun olam. I didn't pronounce it right. <laughs> well, when I was preparing for these remarks, I was reminded that the Ruderman family's work in disability inclusion began from the recognition that children with disabilities were being unfairly excluded from the Jewish day schools in the Boston area. And I was honored, as I mentioned, to be selected for the Morton E. Ruderman Award in 2015, and I am impressed with the impact that this family foundation is having in so many realms, including by supporting synagogues and other Jewish organizations to fully include children and adults with disabilities in their work. Uh, the Ruderman Synagogue Inclusion Project is wonderful here in the Boston area, and all I can say is needed all over America and not just in synagogues. It should be at every church, mosque, every, every place of worship in America. So Jay and Shira and all of you at the Ruderman Family Foundation, we look for you to get beyond the borders of Boston soon and extend this all over the country. Next month will mark the 20th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision in Olmsted VLC, that's how they say those things, where two women with mental disabilities successfully used the Americans with Disabilities Act to force the state of Georgia to allow them to leave an institution and live in the community. 20 years later, we still have way too many Americans with disabilities stuck in nursing homes, other congregate settings, and schools where children are forced to be separated from their non-disabled peers, and way too many more whose lives are artificially restricted by the inadequacy of the supports and services available in their local communities. One of the most important forces in local communities in Massachusetts and around the country is the religious community. Synagogues, churches, mosques, and other religious places are for many Americans, the place where their children learn about faith and values and about culture. Their synagogue, for many, is where they feel their strongest sense of community with people outside of their own immediate families. Cindy spoke about that in her remarks. I, I noted that. When these religious institutions create the kind of inclusive communities that they want to see in the broader world, they teach young people that disability inclusion is about justice, about love, and about doing whatever it takes
to remove barriers that exclude or marginalize individuals and families who want to participate fully in that community. And conversely, when religious institutions intentionally or inadvertently exclude disabled people from their work, they send a message to the whole congregation that some people are just too difficult or expensive or disruptive to be worth the effort. They send the message that these excluded people are somehow less than everyone else. But that message contradicts religious teachings and undermines the moral authority of the religious leadership in that religious community. So I bring up the 20th anniversary of the Olmsted decision because I think the faith community can play a big role in living up to the vision of the Olmsted decision and the law that it interpreted, the Americans with Disabilities Act. When we mark the 20th anniversary of this Olmsted decision, this June 22nd, we should use that anniversary to ask ourselves whether we are doing everything in our power in our own faith communities to ensure that we are truly inclusive. Are the teachers in our religious schools well prepared to meet the needs of all students who might like to attend that school? Are we supporting the development of integrated, accessible, affordable housing in the community, say for autistic adults and others in the communities who are trying to build lives for themselves as disabled adults? Are we making sure that rabbinical schools, seminaries, and other places where we prepare religious leaders are doing everything they can to open wide their doors to people with disabilities who feel called to become religious leaders. I spent some time earlier today um, having lunch with the advisory council for the German Family Foundation. One of their members of their advisory council is an old friend of mine, uh, Tony Coelho, who used to be a congressman from California. Uh, he felt called in his younger life to become a Catholic priest. So he went to the seminary, full of hope and the thoughts that he could be a religious leader. And then they found out he had epilepsy and was told by that religious community that it was the mark of the devil and that he could not serve in that capacity. Imagine, imagine, imagine. So that's why I say people who are felt called to be religious leaders. Well, but there are a lot of young people with disabilities who feel that kind of calling. They should be made welcome. They should be made welcome in those seminaries, rabbinical schools, other places where they learn to become religious leaders. Are we educating our congregations about disability rights and some of the ongoing challenges Americans with disabilities face in the workplace, in the transportation system, in the criminal justice system, in our education system, and in the crucial but inadequate public programs like supplemental security income and Medicaid. I would just note that the Supreme Court's Olmstead decision has been an important tool to enforce the civil rights outlined in the ADA. But a court decision is only a decision unless advocates across the country embrace its principles and work to make that decision a reality. For example, the Justice Department, that's the U.S. Justice Department, has found that young people leaving school in Rhode Island and Oregon have been wrongfully funneled into segregated sub-minimum wage programs instead of being given the opportunity to find jobs where they might be able to meet the personal goal outlined in the ADA of reaching economic self-sufficiency. 
I might digress just a moment here from my prepared remarks. For too long, kids that are in IEPs, individual education programs and schools, when they finish are funneled into just a dead-end job, sub-minimum wage job. Well, maybe that's not what they want. Maybe they have better capabilities than that. But because of low expectations and the system as it is, that's what happens to them. So I told a story about M. M, Emily. M was a young woman who finished her IEP, was funneled into a sub-minimum wage job in a social workshop in Iowa. And M was there for a while. She came home one day and told her mother that she didn't like what she was doing. She wanted to do something else. And her mother said, well, M, now M had an intellectual disability. And so, intellectual and developmental disability. So her mother said, well, M, what do you want to do? And M said, now M is now 21 years old. And M told her mother, I want to be a barista. <laughs> her mother said, later she said, of course she ever got that idea, I don't know. We don't have, this is a small town in Iowa. She said, we don't have baristas. <laughs> So she said, I told him, I said, well, M, you know, to do that, you have to learn how to make coffee and all that. And M said, yes, I want to have a coffee shop and be a barista. And her mother said, well, M, you got to learn how to make coffee. And M said, well, someone told me there's a place in Minneapolis. That's up the road from Iowa. <laughs> where you can learn to, to do that. Well, her mother stepfather, as the case may be, looked into it and found out that is true. So her mother took her to Minneapolis, got her into a two or three week school, learned how to make coffee, you know, espresso and use those fancy machines and all that. They came back to their small town, went to the local bank, and with the help of vocational rehabilitation that gave them some funds, loaned them some funds, <laughs> got a loan from the bank, found an empty storefront, and started M's Coffee Shop. Got a nice machine, and was there. Uh, see, that's been now seven years ago. Now, <laughs> M's Coffee Shop is the center of town now. They now serve lunches and panini sandwiches <laughs> there. And M Hillman, M Hillman, you can look it up, you can Google M's Coffee Shop, Emily Hillman. And M has now five people working for her, all but one of whom have disabilities. It's become a, people have their own coffee cups there. I asked Emily, I said, well, you have all the people with disabilities. How come you hired someone without a disability? She says, well, Senator Tom, that's the way she calls me, Senator Tom, you know, I don't know how to do numbers. So I needed someone to keep the books. <laughs> We all need someone to do our works for us. <laughs> it has been wonderful. And in fact, you can now buy M's coffee online. You go online and she's in competition with Starbucks. <laughs> so, oh, and on the wall there, of course, I took her in once and she got to meet President Obama, so there's a picture of her and President Obama. And a picture of me, too. <laughs> and there's a picture of Hillary Clinton, there's a picture of former Governor Branstad, a Republican, there's a picture of my successor, Senator Ernst, who's a Republican. Well, it's gotten to the point where if you are a politician in Iowa running for office, <laughs> woe to you if you do not stop at Ems Conference. <laughs> Did I mention the name of the town? Independence, Iowa. How about that? Independence, Iowa. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? And Em, she's wonderful, she's there. She remembers people's names, they come in, she's sort of the greeter, the wonderful person there. And, and 
I tell you that story because you, you, you just can't circumscribe people by their physical impairment or their intellectual impairment, their disability. We have to stop having low expectations of our children with disabilities and have high expectations, just like we do for all our kids. Well, I tell you that story because before I left office, the last bill I got passed was a change in the law. Uh, I was chairman of the committee then. I'd taken over the committee after Senator Kennedy passed away. So I changed the law so that no longer can a young person on an IEP be funneled into a sub-minimum wage job. They must first have shown that they have tried competitive integrated employment. That means a real job out in the workplace. Only after two or three tries of that can a place of business, you know, you get a, you get a, a break if you hire a person for these sub-minimum wage jobs, you get a break, you can pay them less than the minimum wage. Before you can do that, you have to show that they have tried uh, competitive integrated employment. But in order to do that, young people need to have work experience. Now, young people, when you're in school, you have what, after school jobs? Maybe a job on the weekend, during school breaks, summer jobs. And you get asked to volunteer for the synagogue. I'll bet you get young people to volunteer for this and that and this and that. Churches do it. United Way, Red Cross. They, oh, but here's the problem. Kids with disabilities never get summer jobs or jobs after school. They don't get any job coaching or shadowing. They really don't even get asked to volunteer to help in volunteer services. So I put in the law a change in vocational rehabilitation. So your state here, your state, like every state, every state vocational rehabilitation, we call them voc rehab offices, 15% of all of their money, federal money that comes in, must be used to help young people in school who have a disability get summer jobs, get jobs after school, that type of thing, so that by the time they graduate, they have a work experience. They have tried maybe one thing or another and found out what they'd like to do. I will close on this, just this part of it. I'm not through with my remarks, totally. <laughs> but this segment of it. When I was having hearings on this before I left the Senate, about cutting this pipeline off, making these young people go into competitive integrated employment, getting voc rehab to work with them to get them these summer jobs. One parent, well-meaning, I'm sure, and very protective of their child with a disability, we all understand that, said to me, Senator, you're just setting these kids up for failure. So I leaned over the rostrum and I said, okay, and what's your point? <laughs> Is your point that kids with disabilities should never experience failure? But failure's a part of life. All of us have tried something and failed at it, tried something else. I said, kids all the time think they want to be this or be that. They try it and they find out they either don't like that or they're not capable of it. Pretty soon they find out what they're capable of and what they like. I said, are you telling me that kids with disabilities should not experience it? Are you telling me they shouldn't have the full life experience? That they some, somehow be segregated out from that? No. Plus, I also added one other thing, and it's in the record. I said, you know, kids with disabilities a lot of times are like kids without disabilities. Sometimes they just need a good swift kick in the pants. <laughs> get them out to start doing things. Well, the rest is history, and I, I, I say that because I hope that as you do this inclusion project with all your synagogues, find out what Voc Rehab is doing here. Find out what they're doing on the local level, on the state level, to implement that part of the, it's only, it went into effect in uh, 
well, probably 16, 17, so it's only been four years. Now, I know some states are doing better than others, but they should all be utilizing that part of that money that they get to get these young kids these after school and summer jobs. It's so vitally important, so I ask that you might put that in as part of your outreach kind of program uh, to talk with people at Folk Rehab. On with my remarks. Students in Georgia have been segregated into what the state calls G-nets, <laughs> where students with disabilities no longer have the right to attend their local public schools. In each of these cases, the ADA and the Olmstead decision has been the tool used to right these injustices. But it doesn't happen without the individual conviction of judges, civil servants, and the voices of our friends and neighbors, especially those in our faith communities. In short, my message to the Ruderman Foundation and to the project, the inclusion project, and to the faith organizations that you support is that your work is a critically important part of living up to the vision of laws like the ADA and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. When I had the honor to be the lead sponsor of the Americans with Disabilities Act in the Senate 29 years ago this summer, July 26th, that's when the president signed it, I followed our constitutional tradition of exempting religious organizations from the law's requirements. But that does not mean that my colleagues and I did not recognize the importance of religious leaders and religious organizations in embracing the inclusive provisions of that law. In fact, the religious community, working with the broader civil rights community, played a critical role in supporting the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. There was no accident that President Bush invited the Reverend Herod Harold Wilkie, a minister with no arms, to be on the stage with him when he signed the ADA into law. Our country is living through a dark period now where some Americans feel emboldened, emboldened in their hatred of Jews, of Muslims, immigrants, the LGBT community, people of color, and anyone who looks different or makes them uncomfortable, including people with disabilities. What kind of message does it send when a candidate for president who is successful in seeking that office mocks in front of a large public audience a person with a physical disability? So let us remember the critical role that the faith community played in the civil rights movement, including the disability rights group, and speak out in defense of all of the Americans, and I added would-be Americans, who have been targeted by hate. Embracing people with disabilities at its core is about loving all people and seeing the inherent dignity and value of all people. It's not about pity or patronizing attitudes towards persons with disabilities, but it's about changing society to make real the four goals of the ADA, full participation, equal opportunity, independent living, economic self-sufficiency. That message is sorely needed in 2019 America, and the faith community is today and has always been one of the strongest and most important forces that can deliver that message in a form where it truly changes people's hearts. And so my friends, here at the Ruderman Family Foundation, the Combined Jewish Philanthropies, and the Inclusion Project, all of you gathered here today, please keep delivering that message. Please keep doing your important work. And please know, that millions of Americans with disabilities and their families and people in every religion are cheering for your leadership and are ready to join you in this work. <laughs>